Hello everyone, Kristen DeFrancisco, Assistant Superintendent of Schools in Groton Dunstable. And I'm coming to you this evening with a vlog on teaching. And as we talk a little bit tonight about teaching, the, my main um, reason for this vlog this evening is because we've been answering lots of questions this week about different kinds of teaching and what teaching looks, feels, and sounds like for our in-school learners and our at-home learners. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about exactly what it does look like for in-school learners and for at-home learners. So I've put together a presentation for you this evening that talks about teaching. It's a word with lots of meanings, and we've been talking more and more about each of the ways we can teach students this week, uh, in particular, as we have as many towns across our state and states across the country have brought kids back to school in various ways. So we'll talk a little bit about that tonight as well. Right now in our state and all across the country and all across different grade levels, from our youngest learners to our oldest, some of our students are learning at home and some of them are learning at school. Uh, many people are comparing the two um, and trying to make sense of how learning at school being six feet apart and learning at home while on Zoom is going to work. Uh, so talking a little bit about the models that we hear about or that are out there, or which town is doing what and why didn't we do this or would this have been better? There's a state platform. Um, this option was not chosen by too many districts. And I think the reason was that it would mean that children would be working mostly asynchronously, which means on their own, on their own timetable, doing all their own planning and not really having any interaction with a teacher or the community. Remote academies, which have been stood up by some of the larger districts. Lots of bigger districts are using these because the remote numbers supported having a standalone academy. Um, still, students are learning both synchronously and asynchronously and always on Zoom. And then there's some combination classes, um, which in particular our district is, has adopted, uh, which is creating classes that have both at-home learners and in-school learners. At-home learners and in-school learners are able to spend some time learning together. At-home learners have opportunities to work with teachers synchronously and will also be doing work independently. And so, as you know, um, our K-8 to is set up this way, and we are working hard to make sure we understand what at-home learners need and what in-school learners need in a very new way to be in school. And learning has changed for everyone. So whether kids are learning in school or at home, uh, it really has shifted. So it's important to think about all the different things that teaching can be as we shift the way we engage students and the way we motivate them also. Um, you know, while we know that there really isn't a replacement for that in-person experience, the in-person experience has also changed as well. So the in-person experience students in school while they may have more face time with that teacher and they may be you know, a little closer to their classmates, there's elements of that that have also changed. So it's not just the at-home learners that are changing the way they are learning. So I can give you some examples of that, changes in teaching and learning. Well, in person, we're six feet apart. Um, we're experiencing specials very differently. One-on-one uh, -on -one instruction looks different. Mask wearing is something to get used to not being able to see each other's faces for sure. Modified break times. And we can take breaks, but they have to look very different than any breaks that kids are used to. Lunches in classrooms for some, not for all. Um, reduced trend, uh, traditional collaboration. So the way that they team, the way that they learn together is a little bit different. And we're, and we're seeking out ways to make that the best it can be. At home, you know, some of the things that have changed is they might be feeling different than some peers that are in school. Now, that doesn't mean kids don't feel different even when they're all together. But this this is something we've heard over the past few weeks that, you know, at home learners are looking at in school learners and, and feeling that a little bit. Um, not having as much face time with a teacher. Um, increased screen time, which we know we try to we try to control. Um, reduced traditional collaboration as well. So there's lots of things that both 
sets of learners are working to understand and to um, shift. So then we think about some roles and terms that have been coming up over the past few weeks. Uh, collaboration, no matter what the model, collaboration has become even more important than it's been in the past. So grade levels are trying to come together and they are trying to collaborate a little bit better around how we do are doing what we are doing. Um, they're trying to support one another as they make sure they're planning for both kinds of learners. And when planning lessons, know that teachers aren't altering the content. They aren't altering the scope and sequence for at-home learners. At-home learners aren't expected to learn less than in-school learners. What they're modifying is the delivery. Um, and it has caused a lot of different discussions about terms. We're hearing it a ton. And so some of those terms are, one of the bigger ones is thinking about direct teaching versus teaching. Direct teaching or instruction really is what is known as for most people, most people when they hear direct teaching, what they think of is, is they think of a teacher standing in front of a group of students directly teaching content, telling, te telling students things that they are learning. Uh, and many are worried that this isn't happening for students learning at home. Um, there are so many ways to teach. So teaching is clarifying for a student. It's reading to a student, redirecting with a student, setting the scene for a video watch, preparing students for a reading experience, revisiting a tricky concept, providing opportunities for students to do their own thinking and learning and discovery with scaffolds. As a matter of fact, direct teaching in the classroom um, is very much coupled with lots of other ways that we can help children um, go on their educational journey. It's better that there isn't as much direct teaching, if I'm being honest. Um, you know, when we think about how we are or what we are saying, you know, children are not a vessel to fill. Um, yes, they may need assistance in scaffolding with different kinds of learning opportunities, but those learning opportunities should be um, various and they should allow students to uh, become independent and do their own thinking. And so we want that in both the at-home setting and the in-school setting. Truth be told, students do best when we provide that variety of different experiences. Uh, we build in learning opportunities that meet the needs of all types of learners. And so right now, that's more than even just at-home and in-school learners. Learners have been various and varied for a long time in classrooms. And teachers are good at figuring out what kids need in order to be successful um, over time. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about time in a few minutes. Um, we balance any direct instruction with ways to collaborate, discover, and learn together. We ask open-ended questions that lead to authentic thinking. And we also scaffold opportunities so students can access them. So there's the truth be told around the pieces around direct instruction. Um, and therein lies the challenge. What teachers are trying to balance right now is giving those opportunities to all types of, the, of learners. Teachers are planning, changing, learning new technology, collaborating, shifting, and thinking in new ways, which they're very good at doing all of those things. But again, it does take time and they're doing brand new things every single day to help meet the needs of our learners. Um, planning asynchronous opportunities for at-home learners that guide them through their learning with the scaffolds that they need or if they need them. And so that's another um, way teachers are spending chunks of their planning time. Uh, a little bit of information about the first few weeks of school. So in-school learners and at-home learners have more in common than you think when we're talking about these first few weeks, especially these first few days. Um, I think something that I've tried to remind everybody is that parents, guardians, families, they're not, you're not in school in a typical year when we are starting our in-person learning, we're getting that up and running. And I will tell you that if you were, you would probably see some same of the similar things that you're finding now that an at-home learner may be waiting for technology to um, be ready to go, or that they may be waiting for the morning meeting to start because of drop-off at the in-person uh, learner schools. I will tell you that these, although they look a little different, in school, on the first couple days of school, first week of school, sometimes even into the second week, 
Um, students are not all in the same place with picking up routines. They are not all in the same place with starting um, school. And so kids do sometimes wait. Um, and I think that that has been certainly thrust into the limelight a little bit because now we're, we're just, we're straddling two different kinds of things, but kids do sometimes wait until those communities are built. So letting it settle in and letting those communities be built over time, this is definitely a year that that's going to be even more paramount than it already is. Um, it is the opportunity for us to teach a growth mindset. And we do that in schools all the time as we're teaching about what it's like to be part of a community. Um, and what you need to know and what I know about teachers over my career is that they are amazing. They will find ways to do things and meet the needs of their students that we, we would never even think of. Um, a lot of times when you have conversations with people who are not in education, they'll say, I don't know how you do what you do. And you really can look at what teachers are coming up with and doing for their students. Um, already, you know, a, a week and a half or so in for most places. Um, and it is nothing short of amazing how they're figuring it out. So the last thing that I'll talk a little about is, is ways to partner and how to give feedback. Of course, we want a homeschool partnership that is working for all of our learners. Um, teachers want to know their students' stories. The narratives of uh, these narratives that you're giving, they really do help them develop these much needed relationships. So they want, we want to know students' stories. Um, tell what something looks, feels, and sounds like for your student. It's important. Um, and But remember to also find the silver linings around things that are um, not working. So in other words, if something isn't working and that's part of your narrative, what is working? Because I'm sure not everything isn't working. So be thinking about that. Um, understanding that your voice is your voice and you do not have to represent the entire community when you call and give feedback or you email and give feedback about your child's narrative. Um, a struggle for a child doesn't have to be everyone's struggle in order for it to be important. Teachers want to hear about your student's story. Um, and we like success stories too. So please think about sharing those stories as well. So I hope this gave you a little peek into really at-home learners and in-school learners. And while there are differences, um, the narratives of any student are important to share. And I think there's more similarities there than we're realizing. Um, but again, everyone's experience is their experience. And as we work through these next couple of weeks of school, honestly, those first six weeks are really important. Lots of building community, um, lots of building relationships. And as we do that in new ways this year, patience and grace and um, watching how this comes together, uh, th there's an opportunity there, I think, for us to see some really great things um, as we move even further into these first six weeks of school. So thank you for watching. Uh, please remember to, if you have a narrative to share, uh, share that narrative. Uh, you can always reach us via email. Um, you can always um, ask for a, a phone call um, and you can always uh, reach out to teachers or even um, myself or Dr. Chesson. So um, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for watching and I look forward to vlogging with you again soon.